I'm speaking with Dr. Cooper C. Graham and Dr. Christoph Ermscher, co-authors of or co-editors of Love and Loss in Hollywood, Florence Deshaun, Max Eastman, and Charlie Chaplin, published by Indiana University Press, February 23rd, 2021. Thank you both for speaking with me. Thank you for having us. So I'll start with uh, Christoph. How did you get into studying and editing a book on this subject? It happened because of my involvement with Max Eastman's life. I wrote a biography of Max Eastman, uh, published in 2017 by Yale University Press. And um, as a result of my work on Eastman's papers at the Lilly Library I, in, at Indiana University Bloomington, mm -hmm. I got to know his contacts very, very well. And Florence Deschamps was a significant influence on him. I became very interested in her. My biography had a chapter on Deschamps. And um, as a result of my work on Eastman's papers, I took... In the next episode, I speak with Sarah McFarland about Echo Collapse fiction and human extinction. Hit the subscribe button to catch that episode. I would add like 200 pages of transcriptions. Mm -hmm. um, and um, in my experience as a biographer, this was not my first biography, transcribing sources is more effective than just taking pictures of them. Uh, so you really get to know the letters. And as a result of doing this, I felt myself sort of almost merging with Deshaun. I became um, entranced with her, enamored with her in some ways. And um, so I had all these letters and I had transcriptions and um, the next logical step was to do something with them. I felt she was bigger than just Eastman's companion mm -hmm. and I did want to do justice to her. And Cooper, um, what, what drew you to this topic and, and how did you end up being a co-editor of a book, of this book? I think my recollections may vary a little bit from Christoph's because as I remember, he has already done the uh, Herculean task of transcribing these letters mm -hmm. in, 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 in the, at, at IU. And um, it was a huge job because what I gather, the, the handwriting wasn't all that great. Uh, and there was an awful, awful lot of times when they weren't very clear. And of course, he'd already written a uh, biography of Eastman. So he knew and still knows more about Max Eastman than I ever will. I came in, I think, mainly um, because maybe I could give a slightly different slant on uh, some of the historical and cultural history of the period from, say, World War I through the early 20s, which is a pretty interesting time, a pretty mean time, by the way. Mm -hmm. And um, also because of the film stuff, I had the opportunity to do quite a bit of work in the early part of the 19th century Anyway, um, so I was somewhat familiar with where I might try to find stuff on Florence and so on and so forth and some of the research libraries around. Mm -hmm. So I sort of came in it from that end, but of course you work together, you get kind of involved in the other part too. And uh, I found both Max and Florence pretty fascinating. So, uh, but I kind of came in sort of in the second half of the game, if you like, and um, I worked from that end. But how did you get into, um, well, also, how did you, are you more of a film historian or cultural historian of the period? Or Yeah, I, um, I've had a checkered career, but I, I finally <laughs> went to NYU and got a, a PhD in film, what's called film history and criticism, which is the equivalent of um, an art history degree. <laughs> it's, uh, I still can't take a photograph that's in focus, but I can write a paper about it. And um, so... I came in from there and that led to a job at the Library of Congress where I worked for 30 years, mm -hmm. ended up as a curator in the motion picture uh, section of the, um, that division. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, the love of my life was opening old film cans and mm -hmm. there is a PhD, a carload down there. Uh, you can't open some of those film cans without finding something unique. Right. I started writing some, fair number of articles and so forth. And so I don't know, there are some other things too. I think, um, I don't remember this, but Christoph said that I helped him um, 
persuade Mike Michon, who was head of the division, to uh, look at a film called Dollars and Cents, which was one of uh, Florence's films that was at the library. Mm -hmm. That's correct. So uh, I don't remember it, Christoph, I'm sorry. It, what actually happened is that I did write to the Library of Congress and didn't get anywhere. And uh, Cooper um, is married to a friend of my wife's. And uh, so I decided un unashamedly to make uh, use of that contact. And, uh, and the DVD I was not able to get through the official channels arrived in my mail without further comment. There was not a note or anything. It was just in the envelope. And that's, that was sort of like the holy grail for me uh, because, you know, there are not too many of Florence's movies that, uh, that have in fact survived. It's Dollars and Cents. Mm -hmm. It's The Loves of Letty. And there's only one copy at the Hollywood archives. Mm -hmm. And um, there's, a, there's a film in which she, uh, uh, makes a five minute appearance or it's not even five minutes. It's like 60 seconds, the third film. Mm -hmm. uh, so I really wanted to have that film. So I still remember that day. It was just in an envelope and it was a DVD and somebody had written in Sharpie on it. And at first I thought, okay, maybe it's not the full movie, but indeed it was. And I still have that uh, DVD today. Yeah. Mm. Um, so, you know, back in this period of time, there were just such a huge number of young women trying to make it in the movies and, and, you know, get noticed and, and, and rise, you know, just like I, you could say like today as well. Um, how did, how did she, what made her special? What, what, what brought her to the forefront and, you know, ended up being, being uh, studied by, by the two of you and others. So I start this up, I would gather, and, you know, I did, I did, I looked through a lot of trade journals and I looked through a lot of magazines in New York, you know, the turn of the century, like the New York Clipper. Mm -hmm. And but also from what Max said and what just just what the record shows, she must have had an incredible magnetism. Mm -hmm. And uh, I mean, Theodore Dreiser kind of fell all over himself trying to talk about the kind of magnetism she had, as mm -hmm. well as Max Eastman. And it seemed as soon, as soon as she started trying to find work in New York and she did other things, too, like she modeled uh, appliances and magazines. And she says that she was a, a model for James Montgomery Flagg and as well as, as Charles Dana Gibson. Uh, it just seems it, it just seems as soon as she, she got to New York, she was finding work. And she started off she, not so much in film, but on the stage. And she again managed to, I think, make friends with an awful lot of producers who just seemed to like her because she had, well, not huge roles in, a, in some stage plays. She was always in them. And mm -hmm. so she got noticed. And uh, she had this magnetic smile. And from what I can gather, uh, she was absolutely hypnotizing. Sometimes more so perhaps in person than what comes over in the film. But nevertheless, she just seemed to have that thing. Uh, and so she got noticed rather quickly uh, in New York. And not an easy place to get noticed. Right. Yeah, and uh, one thing that, that's worth pointing out, she was not sort of one of those waif-like uh, creatures on the screen, like, like Mary Pickford, for example. She was, um, um, she, she had a substantial physical presence. Uh, she, was, she was a strong woman. She was smart. Um, you can tell from the letters. Mm -hmm. uh, that she, uh, they're often ungrammatical and idiosyncratic, uh, but she had a mind of her own. She always wanted to be a writer. And you can tell from the letters that she has a way with words. It's not like Eastman, who's effusive, overly sentimental. Um, he's a poet, he romanticizes things. She's not like this, she's w way more pragmatic. But you can imagine that this skill uh, conveyed itself in conversations as well. You know, she was someone uh, that people would listen to, someone, someone people would notice when she entered the room. And so, and Cooper, you mentioned, you know, that it was a mean time. Um, I think you were referring to the time when she was uh, alive. Um, you know, and the title of the book is Love and Loss. So, so can you tell me as, uh, Christoph, as you were transcribing the letters, what sort of, you know, what, what love and loss were you coming across? What, what strong emotional feelings were you seeing? 
Yeah, so um, for both Florence and Eastman, which is probably why they found each other, there was no like 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 um, m middle middle of, uh, middle of the road kind of approach. Mm -hmm. They were always over the top in their emotions. Um, he was in a different way from her, uh, but certainly there was no um, there was there was no dialing down things and um, the. And love for them was this overpowering thing, all or nothing. Um, Eastman, when he met her, and he writes about this in his autobiography, uh, he met her at a ball, but he noticed her on the street earlier. Um, she, was, she was his Leonardo type. And he, she was somebody that he'd always been dreaming about. He met her at a ball. Next thing we know, he leaves his wife mm -hmm. um, and his son. His son was four years old. Um, devastating consequences for his son, especially, who um, felt abandoned by his father. And even though they reconnected later in life, um, they, were they were never able to patch things up. Um, his son died within a half year of his father. Um, and uh, so there's a, there's a real tragedy there, but it was all or nothing for Eastman. And um, precisely because of that, their relationship became very complicated from the beginning. Florence was functioned in a similar way, uh, but the all or nothing for her also included her career. And it was important to her that she not uh, give up on that, which is why when Samuel Goldwyn made her an offer, she left Eastman, which is something that, that just didn't figure into Eastman's concept uh, of the relationship. I mean, mm -hmm. he tried to be generous about it, but it didn't work. Um, he, was, uh, he was possessive. Uh, he was, despite his feminism, his feminist activism, he was not ready to grant her a life of her own and pelted her with letters, sometimes every day, you know, just smothering her with these emotions that he had. And she very cleverly sometimes responded and said she felt the same way, but she also kept him at arm's length and would write to him, yeah, just let's think about our relationship, but please don't come, not right now, because I'm busy and I actually like it here. Um, so she's able to play that game as well. Loss, um, the inevitable happened. Um, she fell in love with Charlie Chaplin. Um, after indicating very subtly in letters, even before then, there were certain men that she liked and that she liked to look at. Uh, she just placed that very strategically in her letters. And Eastman also fell in love um, with a dancer. Uh, let her know about it too in a letter where he described why he'd fallen in love with her. So loss was inevitable. And um, our book ends with the ultimate loss, and that's the loss of uh, Florence's life um, in February 1922, when that's at least what her friends believed, uh, she ended her life herself, because um, partially because of professional re uh, disappointments, but Eastman played in that too, uh, played a part in that too, and the newspapers did mention that. Um, his role was emphasized um, as somebody who quite likely was one of the reasons. I'm speaking with Cooper Graham and Christoph Ermscher, co-editors of Love and Loss in Hollywood. You can find more information about their work at coopercgram.net and christophermscher.com. If you like this episode so far, please like it and consider subscribing. All of my links can be heard at the end of this episode. Now back to the video. And um, Charlie Chaplin's role in, in all this, um, I, I'll let either of you address address that part. Uh, I'll start it. Um, it's very interesting because when you, uh, the only really uh, large, most of the evidence comes from the fact that Max um, took care of Florence when she came east and she was very ill. Mm. It turned out that she had a fetus that was still born. Uh, that, and uh, she must, she attributed it to, to Charlie Chaplin and told Max that, and Max wrote extensively on it in his books, especially his book, Love and Revolution, that this was, in fact, Charlie's child. Uh, but it is interesting that if you, and, and believe me, I, I worked pretty hard on this, if you go and try to find a record of Chaplin ever saying something about Florence in his memoirs, and he, and he didn't write much in the way of memoirs, uh, you, you find almost nothing. Uh, 
he, he was not a letter writer. And the only real evidence we found that links them is the fact that when Charlie went to um, the Hotel Utah in Salt Lake City to cut the kid, his, one of his biggest hits, uh, there is among the, the, the stuff that Florence left at the New York Public Library, an envelope with Charlie Chaplin's uh, name on it and his handwriting, mm. and which suggests that she did accompany him to uh, Salt Lake City when he left California to cut the film. Mm -hmm. uh, and plus that, as I say, the fact that uh, uh, Max wrote about it extensively, he and Charlie remained friends for the rest of their life. And although Max had already gone public with this long before Chaplin died, Chaplin never denied that the uh, affair took place and but sim simply did not want to, apparently did not want to discuss it. And, Char and Chaplin is not uh, reticent about some of his other affairs that took place in that same, about the same time period. So it was just clearly he felt that Max was a good friend and he just didn't want to get into it. And um, so believe me, as I say, we look pretty hard for evidences of Chaplin. Mm -hmm. And uh, the only other thing we found was a photograph that was apparently taken by Florence on the set of the kid. Uh, and it was apparently, apparently taken, you know, by people who were just watching the scene from the sidelines. Huh. And, uh, it looks like it was Florence's work. Um, I don't know if you have something you would like to add, Christoph, to that. Well, one thing that we should probably correct for the for the um, finished uh, version is that the child was technically not stillborn. Um, she had to have an operation that uh, that Max arranged, and uh, he got his doctor to come, and the fetus had died in utero. So it was actually, and she'd been ill from that for quite a while, and reached out to Max uh, for help. Um, so a pretty dramatic uh, development. And um, one of the things, um, so the situation with Charlie, one of the things to think about is that Eastman um, had in fact introduced her to Charlie Chaplin. Um, they, uh, they had met uh, during a fundraising tour that Eastman made uh, to, to Los Angeles. And um, there's a great photo in our book of the two of them together. And um, it's one of those those things, you know, afterwards, Max wish, probably wished he had not uh, made that introduction for Florence. Um, Charlie sauntered into Florence's life at a point where Florence was very receptive uh, to uh, Chaplin's attention. Um, Eastman had been sending her letters about uh, how busy he was and uh, how preoccupied he was in New York, um, editing The Liberator, uh, the radical magazine that he was editing. And... Um, Eastman's letters tended to be whiny. And with Chaplin, somebody came into her life, really one of the most famous men in the world at the time. Mm -hmm. um, somebody who believed in this craft. And um, we have a beautiful letter in the volume. Florence uh, was one of the first to see uh, a rough cut of the kid. Mm -hmm. and, and she's overwhelmed. Um, she, it's one of the greatest things she's ever seen. And, and she writes to Eastman, she says, it was, it's wonderful, 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 she says. I laughed and I cried. I've never seen anything like it. You know, there was a true genius for her, not somebody who was always like complaining about this or that and how much he had to do and so forth, but somebody who had a vision. And so that definitely played a role in that. And uh, Chaplin himself, he had walked away from his disastrous uh, marriage to Millard Harris and the birth of his, um, his uh, malformed son and, um, for him, it was also a kind of escape. And in that same letter, Florence also writes, Charlie's proposing that we travel all over the world and we'll, be, we'll go in a car and we'll just keep driving and, and so forth. So everything seems to fall into place. And of course, you know, the, the thing that, that she wasn't aware of is that Chaplin was a cat. He was, uh, he was somebody who was notorious um, in his relationships with women. There's evidence that he cared about her deeply uh, when she goes up to New York uh, to seek help from uh, Eastman and Eastman has that surgery performed. Charlie arrives and is like hanging out on the periphery. You know, he's suddenly in Croton mm -hmm. and showing up, basically stalking her, following her. So there's definitely um, a very deep uh, connection that he feels. We know from one of the letters in the volume that Florence was... Um, 
was, according to her own description, in, in a day's pleasure, um, in the famous traffic jam um, in LA. Uh, we only have her description. Cooper uh, did some detective work and we looked at uh, whatever evidence we had from the shooting of the day's pleasure. We could find no evidence that she was in it. Um, if she was, uh, Chaplin cut her out later on. She describes how she would drive on the set, uh, onto the set in her Ford Model T. She was she was famous as a reckless driver around uh, LA. She would crash cars once, even when she was test driving a car. Um, yeah. But she was known to be um, to be a car fiend. And there she was in the traffic jam. She describes how she, uh, the policeman, the famous scene, and so forth. It sounds completely authentic, except as Cooper was describing, we couldn't back it up. There's just her letter. Um, and I think driving cars back then was a pretty difficult task. So just so, you know, being a bad driver means something different then than I think it would uh, now. One of my favorite letters, it's actually, you know, Florence's letters, a letter, it's a letter by Max Eastman. He describes, he writes to her, it's one of the longest letters, how he's dri driving his car and he picks up um, um, uh, uh, Claude McKay, uh, the poet, and uh, his friend George is in the car and they're driving in New York and all of a sudden this boy walks across the street and Eastman knows he can't stop. I mean, he's gonna run, that, run over that kid. So he intentionally crashes the car, yeah. drives it into a curb and crashes the car and the boy's fine. And he takes the boy, takes the boy back to his mother, asks the boy for his address. And then he's in this apartment, which is full of kids. And there's the mother completely overwhelmed. And she doesn't care. You know, he tells her, you know, I just saved your kid. I saved your kid's life. And she's like, yeah, whatever. And, and his car is wrecked. Yeah. <laughs> and wow. Of course, in the letter, then the, interpret the narrative that he offers is like he was thinking of his own son. And why, that's why he had to do it. But still, the car is broken. Yeah, yeah. Um, so as far as... Um what's the importance of these relationships in film history? Um, you know, they're engaging these, these relationships, but is there a bigger story? I would say that probably um, for the most part, not. Um, I think that Florence again was really a casualty of uh, the business at the time. Mm -hmm fact that it was pretty cutthroat that you have very very limited chances if you were a starlet on golden studios or any of the studios mm -hmm. name for yourself and to uh become a bigger star and if not uh, that was kind of the end of your career and a couple of other things were working against florence she was somewhat larger than some of the other starlets if if people were looking for people the size of mary pickford or um irene castle which was the what people were looking for at that time, Florence was kind of large. Um, there's also some, she writes, mentions in her letters that um, the other starlets, that she wasn't much liked at the studio. She had some leftist views and she was pretty outspoken on women's suffrage, mm -hmm. got people's backs up. But probably the major reason she got fired was because simply was there was a terrible depression at the time. People don't know what there was a pretty bad depression between about 1919 and 1921. Mm -hmm. I'm not about 1929. This is earlier and it was mm -hmm. first. and it of course hit those industries which are you know provide entertainment because the one easy place you can trim your budget is we won't go to the movies this week. Mm -hmm. Well all of a sudden the studios and stuff are hurting very badly many directors, many actors and actresses and so on and so forth got fired and had to forlornly head back to the East Coast. I kind of think that's what happened to Florence. However, um, and I'm gonna send this back to Christoph. Christoph, I think came up with a very interesting thesis or at least, at least an idea about how maybe Florence's life and kind of tragic outcome on her suicide uh, may have influenced one of Chaplin's most interesting later works. And I'm going to turn it back over to Christoph on this, if I may. Okay. Yeah, I will probably, first of all, ask you a question about the relationships. Um, ultimately, yeah. what you see um, again and again, that they didn't help her much. Um, she got fired when she got fired by Goldman. Goldman was breaking her contract. Um, Eastman um, 
went into full gear and called on his friends and so forth and right. sent telegrams um, advising her what to do. It did not help her. Chaplin didn't do anything for her uh, when she was when when she was fired. Her whatever she was able to do came from her own grit, her determination, which wore out at the end of her life, and sometimes from friendships, but not from romantic relationships. The acting gigs, for instance, that she that she had at the end of her life, she she got through friends. Uh, but ultimately, her lovers left her alone. And um, what Cooper was referring to is um, uh, when you when you think of um, Chaplin's, probably one of the most uh, best known, the, the best known films, and definitely one of his greatest, Limelight, um, in 1952. Uh, when you think of uh, Chaplin, plays the role of that clown, uh, Calvero, the aging clown. And, uh, and what happens in that film is um, at the end of the film, um, when uh, the dancer that the clown is in love with, uh, Terry Ambrose, um, when, she, when she opens the gas and dies or is about to die, the clown just arrives in time to save her. Um, when you think of that, uh, by contrast, uh, Florence's suicide, um, again, by gas asphyxiation. That was what the uh, death certificate said. No one was there to save her. Um, Eastman was called, came rather late, gave blood when she was already in the hospital, but it was too late. Um, she couldn't be saved anymore. And it's tempting to think of um, that scene in Limelight as a sort of posthumous, uh, retroactive kind of redemption um, that, uh, that, uh, that Chaplin is offering. Again, that's a that's, that's not backed up by anything. It's just a hunch um, that you have when you watch that film. And the parallels are pretty obvious. Well, how, how commonplace was it? Well, you know, how many of the, the women that the chaplain knew or, um, or, or Eastman or committed suicide or even how often did people commit suicide in that manner? Do you have any, any ideas? Because I think if it wasn't commonplace, that, that, that backs up your idea a little uh, bit more. As far as I know, it was not commonplace. I mean, the, it, both Max and Charlie were, let's face it, hounds in somewhat different ways. Mm -hmm. Most of their um, ex-girlfriends didn't jump out of windows or turn on the gas. It was just uh, some, usually some bad feelings and so on and so forth. So mm -hmm. this ending of Lawrence was pretty much hers only. And there is also the fact, and some, some other people who knew both of them, both Max and Florence said, look, Max, don't you know, beat yourself up too much about this thing because Florence wanted a career. She wanted to be a star and she wanted that more than anything in the world. And when that didn't pan out, she became very, very depressed. So, uh, I mean, not that the Max or Charlie thing helped, but probably maybe her, her main motive in taking her own life was she was very disappointed in her career. She was pushing 30. Um, I always thought maybe Marilyn Monroe was facing the same fate, you know, when she, uh, when she, you know, ended her life, mm -hmm. a great beauty and it starts to go. It's very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, that's just, I'm just spitballing. I don't know that either. Um, <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry. Did, did she have, how, how about her feelings about uh, losing the child? Did that create some sort of depression in any way or the child? Mm -hmm. Well, it was a couple of years between me and the, and the stillborn child and uh, the end of her life. So maybe uh, she must have thought about it. Um, again, we'll never know. Another really interesting thing about this whole project for me is realizing how much we censor ourselves when we write letters, uh, all of us. And um, I always get the feeling that about Florence, especially that she didn't want to say too many things that were going to upset Max or talk about things that didn't interest Max particularly, because Max was a guy who was primarily interested in Max. So um, I don't know. Uh, so, you know, there's still an awful lot we don't know about these people. And it's, I wish we did. Mm -hmm. In terms of um, 
suicide in the entertainment industry generally, of course, there's plenty of examples. Um, there's uh, uh, David Fraser's uh, book, um, I think it's called Suicide in the Entertainment Industry that starts with Peg Entwistle who jumped off the Hollywood sign. And, uh, and Marilyn Monroe, of course, is a famous example. But uh, in Eastman's life, uh, part of the official narrative, and Eastman was a famous womanizer, is that all these women knew what they were letting, them, letting themselves in for. Um, Eastman was always clear that, uh, you know, he was not offering any, any, any chance of permanent attachment. Um, that narrative turned out to be not quite true once I started working with the papers. And there were letters that did not make it into Eastman's uh, voluminous autobiography, which did indicate there was uh, quite a lot of broken glass along the way. And, uh, a, but something that didn't fit his, um, his own self image as somebody who had discovered uh, pleasure or his ability to give pleasure late in life and there was no holding back. Um, he, he always announced that he didn't believe in marriage, uh, but he was married three times, uh, that's a fact. Yeah. And uh, which seems to contradict that narrative a little bit. Um, but what he, what he did say and what he kept saying was that among all his relationships, Florence was the most important one. And, uh, and he kept revisiting it, uh, even late in his life. One of the um, moving things about working with the Eastman papers um, at the Lilly Library was that he revisited um, Florence's letters, for example, all of which he'd taken from her apartment uh, when she died and annotated them. So you see these letters that were written in 1919, 1920, 1921, and you got this shaky old man's handwriting on it, summarizing them, commenting, uh, commenting on them, her last letter and things like that. So it's present for him in the 1950s as he's revisiting this. And one of the uh, interesting things is that uh, he started, even though he was married, that never kept him, an affair with a secretary who was working for him whose name was Florence Norton. Mm. And um, her journals we do have. And one of the things that she records is how irritating it was to be constantly compared to that other Florence. Uh. Where, where was Florence from, the original one? <laughs> uh, uh, Florence was uh, from uh, Tacoma, Washington. And um, uh, she was born Florence Danks. Um, her father, interestingly enough, was a bigamist. Uh, he had another family back in England um, mm. that uh, Florence's mother, um, who was from Austria, did not know about, uh, we assume. And that unconventional family didn't last very long. They had moved to New York uh, when Florence was about 10. Mm -hmm. And at which point um, a, his father abandoned um, both her mother and her. Uh, there was a brother, Samuel, who does resurface a little bit later in life. Uh, but other than that, uh, it was just Florence and her mother from that point onward. I'm speaking with Cooper Graham and Christoph Ermscher, co-editors of Love and Loss in Hollywood. You can find more information about their work at coopercgram.net and christophermshire.com. If you like this episode so far, please like it and consider subscribing. All of my links can be heard at the end of this episode. Now back to the video. How is the, the book laid out? Um, is it just kind of a chronological look or is it organized into themes or in any way or... We organized it chronologically and uh, from the beginning uh, to pretty much the last letter and there's a coda that revisits uh, her suicide and the letters that Eastman received after she died. One from Florence's nurse, another one from, from a friend to which Cooper referred earlier, who's essentially telling Eastman, as Cooper already said, not to worry too much about it. Uh, Florence was depressed and uh, don't blame yourself too much. Mm -hmm. So it's chronologically ordered, um, but divided into sections by, 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 um, sort of blocks of years. Uh, so we have one section, the early years, um, then we have the uh, first year in Hollywood, uh, then the second year in Hollywood, and then we, the final, uh, sort of the denouement. And the letters are um, interspersed with narrative inserts in which we provide context, stories, um, useful information, 
uh, film summaries and so forth, which were co-written by Cooper and myself. Mm -hmm. What would you say for each of you, um, what was the most surprising thing you came across? And that could be either about these individuals or the time or wow. even the, the entertainment industry at that time. Um, I'm going to say, I think the most interesting thing to me was that how, what a rough time it was from say 1917 to 1922 or 23 in the United States. It was a mean time. Uh, I think a lot of people have this idea about the roaring 20s is there's a big starty that big party that started uh, at Armistice and went nonstop until Black in Black Thursday, uh, October 1929. Uh, and it wasn't like that. Those first years were very, very difficult. 1919 was the year when lynchings were at their highest. There were um, burnings and major race riots in almost major, every major American city in 1919. It was called the Red Summer. Mm -hmm. uh, there was this depression I, I, I mentioned. Uh, there were a lot of soldiers who came back from, my, from the war and all of a sudden there weren't any jobs for them. Uh, there was the, a little later, there were the Palmer Red Scares when uh, anybody tried to try to organize labor was simply rounded up. Thousands of people were just tried without any lawyers or with any record counsel at all. Many of them were deported, just put on boats and sent back where they quote where they came from, unquote. Mm -hmm. It was a very, very, very rough time. Uh, the, perhaps the best thing about it was this is when women's, the, you know, the, the women's suffrage uh, amendment went through, but it was also prohibition. It was also uh, uh, maybe a high point of censorship in the United States. And uh, this had a profound effect on the kind of movies that were being made. And they certainly affected Florence's career in that way too. It was a rough time. It was, a, you know, and, um, this idea that it was just, a, as I say, a big party the whole time simply is not true. Um, I think it was surprising to me to realize how rough things were during that period. Mm -hmm. For and me, I think the biggest surprise was how much I came to love Florence. Um, Eastman was a kind of ambivalent character. I was fascinated by him, mm -hmm. but I was also repulsed by some aspects of his life. Um, and um, it had become sort of um, almost routine for me as a biographer that I would always end up with characters that I had ambivalent feelings about. Uh, my previous book was about a 19th century uh, scientist, Louis Agassiz, who was a racist, as well as a brilliant biologist, but um, I despised uh, many aspects of him. Um, with Eastman, I was fascinated by him, but I didn't love him. Florence was somebody I came to adore um, um, to a worrying degree in some ways. I mean, I found myself in Hollywood at some point trying to find her house, taking pictures of it and so forth. So I was, I was essentially stalking a, a dead character. And, um, but uh, transcribing her, um, especially sort of when you spend a lot of time transcribing letters, it's almost like a friendship. At first, you uh, you can't read like, every other word. Um, you become more and more familiar. After a while, it's no problem at all. It's like speaking to a friend, but it, I, I, I suffered with her. I, I lost all sense of critical distance at one point and I just thought that every single word that she wrote was great. Um, um, Cooper reminded me that sometimes these were just very pragmatic notes uh, that, that didn't carry any special significance or poetry, but I still think that some of the letters are very poetic. And I, I felt that when, when her suicide, her likely suicide, when that took place, it was like the biggest injustice that had ever happened to anybody. Um, so I had to take a step back, of course, in order to do the book. But um, it was nice to discover within me uh, a, sort of the different mode of interacting with a character. And, um, and that was a surprise that came from working on this book, um, I would say. It's almost like you took over Max's role. Yes. Um, in, <laughs> in, uh... Yeah, I found myself sometimes shouting at him. Apparently, I did so once literally in the reading room of the Lilly Library. So the librarian came over to check in with me. Uh, but 
Wow, yes, you became invested. Um, yes. yes, that's right. So obviously there's a lot of questions, a lot of gaps in information um, in this story. But was there a particular question that really stands out for both of you that you really wanted to get an answer for or two and, and finally did feel like you did get to something or, or st you'd still love to figure some aspect of this out? Personally, I would love, still love to find something about, about Chaplin or from Chaplin, you know, see how he felt about this. But I don't think that's going to happen. When, Ch when Charlie wanted to be quiet, he could be very, very, very quiet. Uh, I doubt that's going to happen. But yeah, there are a lot of questions. I mean, I, you know, I feel, I, I, in a way, I, I, <laughs> I mean, this is such a movie cliche, but I keep thinking of Rosebud, you know? Yeah. You, you see Citizen Kane and you end up, you still really don't know a whole lot. And uh, I, I have lots of questions about these people. Uh, I guess I'm, I'm afraid I'm not going to find out. But yeah, I, but I'm hoping in one way that this book, and I, from my, and I know from past experience, sometimes you write these books and all of a sudden somebody writes and says, oh, yeah, uh, maybe you didn't know about Charlie Chapman doing something or you didn't know about this letter that's in Cleveland or, you know, something like that. And sometimes or a movie that, you know, is found or, or at least a clip of it. So I would certainly hope that maybe this book will bring something to light. I hope so. Anyway. Yeah. Actually, with my other podcast, just today I connected two completely separate people on a, on a subject that they would never have otherwise connected before, like Im important connections. So, so it does happen. I know that for sure. It does. Uh, it does. And Christoph. I would uh, second what Cooper said. I would love for another uh, another one of Florence's movies to surface again. I would like to see The Loves of Letty, which exists only in one copy at the, at, uh, at the film archives um, in Hollywood. I would like to watch it again. I only got one chance to watch it. It's in very fragile condition. Mm. So I had to make an appointment and uh, it's, it's several reels and I had to sit there with two curators and watch it. And um, also translate the intertitles, which happen, which happened to be in French, because that's the copy they had. Mm -hmm. So there were certain things I just missed because I was focused on translating and not uh, didn't pay attention to the film. Love to see it again, um, get a different perspective on it. I would like to find her grave in uh, 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 Mount Zion Cemetery mm -hmm. in Queens. I went out there. Uh, but a, and I knew the general area, but I, but most of the inscriptions on the stones are withered. At least one mystery uh, was cleared up by that that, that she was Jewish, mm. and um, because she was buried in a plot that belonged to a Jewish burial society, uh, that's what the records reveal, and uh, something that she never addressed when she was in Hollywood. Um, and definitely something that that she maybe didn't try to cover up, but uh, uh, she sort of sidelined by perpetuating this narrative about the gypsy actress that she was, and she kept saying that, uh, and and the press bought it. Uh, so that was one mystery that was clarified. Mm -hmm. I would like to uh, get some confirmation or find some of the scripts that she was working on because she does write about in the letters in her letters later on that she transitioned to script writing and that she got some advice on how to do that. I found a likely uh, draft for a script, but uh, very, very abortive, uh, didn't amount to very much. Uh, so I would like to see that, I would like to find something else somewhere. Uh, we do have a short story that, um, a, that she wrote um, that was published ironically just within weeks after her death, which does reveal that she had some talents as a writer uh, which makes me think that there's more somewhere and I would like to find it. It was not in the papers, uh, in, in our papers at the Lilly Library. I'm sorry, did you say it was a published story or just- It was a published story, yes. Under, did she use her name or a, another name? Yeah, Cooper, do you want to talk about the story? Florence's well, story. Are we talking about the, the great art? The... Yes, yeah. There is, um... A story with her name on it. Uh, it's called, I think it's called A Great Art. Yes. 
which was in um, what Photoplay magazine? Yes. Yeah. And which uh, she is kind of scathing about Hollywood. And she's, this gets kind of complicated, but uh, what happens is uh, one, one of the things that was going on in Hollywood was um, Goldwyn, especially, uh, would pay very, very high prices to famous authors. Uh, so just so he could get a script with their name on him. And he might not even, since most of the authors didn't know anything at all about film writing, uh, in a lot of cases, uh, they just have, have, a, have a script with, say, Mary Roberts Reinhardt's name on it. Mm -hmm. And instead of using what she wrote, uh, and, I, and I'm not talking about any particular film here, this is from the top of my head, uh, they'd have one of the, you know, the writers, sort of the hacks in the studio, write, write a, something to go with this title. And then they could use, you know, some pretty big names uh, of writers on the scripts. And, and, and Goldwyn was one of the people that did a lot of this. And he started a thing called the Eminent Authors. Uh, Goldwyn partially did it because um, <laughs> he didn't have any money to pay stars big prices. So uh, he generally picked people who weren't terribly well known, but he did believe in good writing. As a matter of fact, Goldwyn did all his life. But anyway, uh, this story deals with a fictitious producer uh, and a guy who bullies his way into seeing uh, the producer and uh, the producer makes a lot of fun about his ideas and really cheapens them and comes up with this very tawdry idea for a script. But then they find out this guy's actually a fairly famous British writer. So they pay him a huge amount of money just so they can use his name and then throw away the script and just keep this little piece of paper with his name on it. <laughs> they and get the title, yeah, and the title. Pardon? Yeah, it came out in the moving picture world and was within, within weeks of a death, ironically. It was a satire. And, uh, yeah, yeah. And, uh, and it's very poignant that, you know, she didn't live to see that. And since it's a story about the failed script, that makes me think that she did have considerable experience or at least tried her hand at script writing. And uh, so that reflects on experiences that she had and also on the... It's her feelings about Hollywood. They're essentially encapsulated uh, in it. Uh, the, we have references in several of her letters where she says about Hollywood, they do nothing but brag about their power and how much they can help girls like me and what they can do for me, but they don't. And at some point she even says, there's no poetry or beauty in, in filmmaking. You know, that's what, that's happening as she is in Hollywood. And um, so that that's kind of the summary of her of her experiences, and um, and it's it makes me think that there was considerable talent there. As as we point out in the book, it's not on the level of some of the greatest satires of Hollywood um, ever written, uh, but it's certainly um, uh, quite um, quite a quite a pronounced critique and 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 well done. One of, uh, you, you... Excuse me, I just want to say, she also, if you go through this, she wrote a couple of letters to Max describing some uh, encounters with some of the sleazy producers out there, saying, kind of saying, you know, pretty, making it pretty clear that she and a couple of other starlets were supposed to show, starlets were supposed to show these guys a good time. Yeah. Which may, you know, the, the Harvey Weinstein thing did not start, you know, a couple of years ago. In her, yeah. The, well, the passage I just quoted is from, from one of those letters. They do nothing but brag about their power. Yeah, um, yeah. That's, that's sort of a summary of a dinner with some of the Hollywood moguls that, that you know, lead her to believe or try to uh, lead the women to believe that they can do everything for them. And then they won't, of course. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, I want to ask a question. So you mentioned, and this might be well beyond the scope of your book, um, but her being Jewish, and it just reminds me and I'm sure this has been written plenty of on, you know, there was so much anti-Semitism in the country um, in that period and onwards. And yet you had these Jewish, um, you know, the Jewish Hollywood moguls who could still succeed in business. Um, so it just, it's just interesting that you could have so much anti-Semitism and yet you could have these, these very powerful Jewish men entertaining the country essentially. Um so I don't know. That was just a comment. I don't know if you have anything that could connect with her life or, or what you came across. 
Well, I do. What I have read is that, uh, an awful lot of uh, Jewish uh, immigrants did go into the movie business because it was about the only thing that wasn't locked up by, uh, you know, Ang Anglo-Saxons and somebody else, and all the other sort of groups who like in banking and so on. Hmm. Not, not that uh, Jews couldn't make a lot of money in banking, but uh, especially if you're an immigrant, I mean, like um, Goldwyn started off I think as a haberdasher selling stuff from town to town in New England mm -hmm. after birth of a nation. And all of a sudden everybody's, Hey, we can make a lot of money doing this. I think a lot of guys who are trying to scrabble their way out of the um, lower East side, of New York mm -hmm. said, my God, we, we got a real choice to make some money here. And a lot of them tended to be Jewish, not all of them. Mm -hmm. And uh, Florence does quote in one of her letters, um, some of her fellow actresses she, she hangs out with, they're using an anti-Semitic slur uh, for the Hollywood bosses. And uh, so she's aware of the anti-Semitism that's shared by the people working in the industry that she's with. And of course, at that point, she doesn't come out and tell them, okay, I'm one of them too. Um, so. That's a very revealing window onto this complexity that uh, that you are just describing. And also, Charlie Chaplin didn't he hide his political feelings as well, or just at, at least early on because he was very—I I don't know if he was a communist, but very, um, um, I guess, radical ideas. Is that correct? Am I? He was outed. He was outed as a parlor Bolshevist. That's the term that uh, in the press that was used for him, mm -hmm. and um, and that became something that that was officially downplayed. But uh, it was very clear that this was one of the bonds between him and Eastman, and uh, that 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 led to their friendship in the first place. He attended. Uh, one of Max's lectures, um, uh, part of Max's Hands Off Russia tour. Mm -hmm. um, Charlie shows up and a uh, picture gets taken afterwards. So that's that's a very interesting um, um, uh, um, situation that, that happens there. And did you say, I, forgive me if you mentioned this earlier in the interview, but was she, was Florence very political or was she just you know, what was her sort of political connection or w with the two of them? We do mention a uh, report um, that was uh, submitted uh, to uh, the uh, local um, secret police about uh, Florence and Max sharing the same opinions. Uh, they're showing up at parties, at radical parties. There's also a story that we couldn't confirm that um, Florence refused to rise uh, for the national anthem at a movie premiere, and that this was a political statement that she was making. Uh, our source for this is Max's um, a statement um, in one of his autobiographies, but I, we were not able to confirm this uh, through a newspaper report or anything. Hmm. Word of mouth apparently had gotten out about that. What... Um... So my next question is normally what what about this what in this research had an emotional impact um, on you and I think Christoph you did mention how invested yeah. um, you got into all of this but and Cooper um, do you have something that really had an emotional impact on you I would have to say that I and my wife she read this thing too and I would hear her snort. <laughs> make comments about how much and we both said that we pretty much hated Max Eastman uh, it's pretty hard to walk away from that book without disliking Max intensely but you know and I had to go through those things four, three or four times because of the damn proofreading and you, know, you couldn't just you know it was very hard to read those things yeah. um, but um I, I did try to say, well, you know, yeah, okay. And, and maybe Max is kind of a swine, but at least he kept all his correspondence. And there's a lot of it does not, does not reflect very favorably on Max. And Max was not dumb enough to not realize that this makes him look pretty weird mm -hmm. and pretty unsympathetic. And so at least I think he had, 
he may have gotten rid of some stuff that was particularly damning to him, but the fact that he retained most of it and turned it over, I'm getting, I think I had Christoph shaking his head. Uh, he never threw anything out. Um, that's, that's why the papers are so voluminous. Yeah. Yeah. So I gotta, I gotta give Max credit for that, but that's about as far as I can go. He not a very, he's not very likable in these letters. Well, he was about to be liked. Um, he was, um, he came from a um, religious background and I think the, the most important thing for him was, or the revelatory thing that he did was shed those religious ties and then went for the kill um, in his life and was not out to be liked. Um, his achievements are considerable. I mean, he was the editor of the two most important radical magazines ever published in the US, uh, the, the Masses and the Liberator. And uh, that's an achievement that cannot be taken away from him. And he did get to that point because he was irresistible. And it was just this verbal onslaught uh, that, he, that he unleashed when he wanted something. He was a great facilitator. He was one of the greatest uh, commentators on Russia early on, um, ferociously smart. And that elevated Florence too. And that's, that's important to remember that um, her relationship with Eastman gave her somebody who had no real education to speak of. Um, that was her university really to, to being exposed to Max's influence, the books she read through him, um, the, uh, the hints he gave her. Uh, the people that he introduced her to, whether it was Chaplin or later the photographer Margarita Mather, who became her companion for a while, um, who was one of the greatest early 20th century uh, photographers, really. These are people she met through Max, and Max had that skill. I mean, he knew everybody. He retained everything. He had this capacious memory that never let go of anything at all. And Florence knew that. Um, I think it beat, she beat him eventually at his own game because uh, she, she took what she needed mm. and then tried to liberate herself from him. Didn't completely work, but at least she was on her way towards doing that. Mm -hmm. what, uh, what, what sort of repercussions did Max suffer from being so outspoken in his political beliefs? Different uh, repercussions because he changed course politically. Um, he became very conservative. He was one of those uh, uh, intellectuals like Arthur Kessler and so forth that became right wing in many ways. Mm. And, uh, and his former friends turned against him and rightly so because she felt, they felt that he, he had betrayed them. The repercussions that he suffered from were he was definitely, there were detectives while he was still, um, you know, this leftist prince of the of the village as he was known there were detectives outside his house rifling through his garbage and he writes about that and and he would just out of spite he would feed them pages from Kant's critique of pure reason uh, just to give them something to think about and he got a kick out of them uh, you know going through them trying to you know puzzle over what he'd thrown out um, but up in Croton where Florence lived as well there was this communist kind of um, community, this enclave, uh, enclave that he that he created, and 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 the police would come out there, and people would report because they lived on a hill, and you know would see them sort of coming up, and everybody knew that they were headed their way, um, and Eastman held this together. He was he was he was a very handsome man. He was very charismatic. Uh, he was he was awful in many ways, but it was part of his charm because he was not somebody who tried to be nice. And people respected that. Um, so these were the re repercussions he suffered early on. He went to the Soviet Union. He was one of the first to report consistently about what, what was going on. Mm. He became Trotsky's biographer, mm. uh, wrote about Trotsky, um, was personal friends, was friends with uh, Trotsky. When he performed that political turn towards the right, some of the same people that were his buddies now turned against him. And there were some who said, you know, he was always a snake. Mm -hmm. He was always like that. We are not surprised. I mean, he's the same bastard uh, that he's always been, except now he's on the right. But even when he was on the right, um, people were not comfortable with him. He wrote for National Review. 
but his atheism, which he never let go of, uh, made him suspect to some of his friends on the right as well. So at the end of his life, he was kind of unmoored a little bit. He, he was in this kind of vacuum, really, uh, kind of regretting the turn his life had taken, mm -hmm. but be, not being able really to, to put things, to put the pieces together again. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the very fascinating thing about this book is how many aspects of American society in this period it seems to touch on. Um, so yeah, wow. Um, what, what do the two, so apart from providing information on their lives, what, what do the two of you hope this book will do for readers? Personally, I, I think would familiarize them with uh, a little bit more about Max and certainly more about Florence, who's pretty much of a known unknown quantity. Uh, but I think mainly to take another good, long, hard look at the period, which is much more complex than I think most people give it credit for. Um, at the same time that all these, these mean things were happening that I was talking about, one of the reasons they were happening was because it was a period of great ferment, and so many things were happening so fast, and the First World War had sort of caused so many things to bubble to the surface. Uh, and changed American society so much that perhaps a repression was absolutely understandable. Mm. I would just like to see people know more about the period. I think it's much more interesting than I thought it was. And reminds me a lot, a little bit, a lot about now. And also maybe the period after World War II, when again, the uh, United States went from Roosevelt, New Dealism to UAC in a few years. Mm -hmm and maybe for somewhat similar reasons. So, yeah, I think that's what I'd like to see people get, get out of it anyway. First off? I would, I would like to see people be entertained by it. And it is an entertaining story. I would like to, I would hope they'd be affected by the tragic parts of it and uh, see the human price that, uh, that, that Hollywood exacted from people early on. Um, I would like them to rediscover Florence Deshawn, who is somebody who aimed high and failed, not through anything that she did wrong, but because of the configuration in which she found herself in. I felt an obligation to, um, to resurrect her, mm -hmm. uh, to give readers a sense of who she is. I also think it's a, it's a, it's, it has novelistic potential. I mean, it's a film script right there when you think about it. Um, the triangles are always interesting, uh, but this one involves Charlie Chaplin, who's um, <laughs> probably one of the most, uh, uh, or was one of the most famous people in the world at the time. So for that reason alone, I think the story would be interesting. Mm -hmm. And I also think that the writing is, uh, can be quite compelling. And again, there are some letters by Florence that are absolutely beautiful. And uh, it's funny at times. I would like to enjoy them too. One of, uh, to enjoy those. I would like readers to enjoy those episodes as well. Mm -hmm. One of my favorite uh, episodes is when she drives Max to the, to the train station in LA and he gets on the train and he has her car keys. And she's, the car is parked right there and Florence can't, can't use it because she can't start it. And then she tries everything under the sun, um, writes bad checks right and left, as she says to people who promise, them, uh, promise her that they can fix it. She gets a mechanic who takes the car apart and can't put it together again and so forth. And it's, it's, it's a really, it's a great novelistic moment. And she's all sad that Max has left and immediately her sadness turns to irritation. And Max travels on on the train, he goes to San Francisco and the next thing he does, he has a love affair uh, with, with a fan that he meets there. Um, no guilt whatsoever, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, you, that's, that's, that's just great and you can't make these things up. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one of the novels, probably the novel that has, has had the most impact on, on my psyche is, is The Great Gatsby. And I certainly love this period because right. of it. So, so I agree that it's fat, you know, this story is, would be a fascinating read um, for anyone interested in that period and in general. Um, what, do you have a, a current writing project that either or both of you are working on or editing project? Um, I, am, 
I'm, huh? I am contemplating my navel. I'm pretty much, okay. I, I think I'm tired and I, I, I don't really want to take on anything right now or for quite a while, maybe some, sometime, but it would have to be something right up my alley. And I, right now I'm, no, the answer. <laughs> okay. Chris Al? I have something entirely unrelated. Um, um, my other interest is in history of science and I have a, new book coming out from the University of Chicago Press uh, um, about John James Audubon, the bird uh, guy. And mm -hmm. it's a collection of his uh, writings about the ocean and mm -hmm. water birds. And it's co-edited with, uh, uh, with a friend of mine uh, who is actually um, an expert on marine, th marine things and the ocean and so forth. And we're looking forward to that. It's an anthology, but it has a preface and narrative inserts. It's sort of the same kind of principle a little bit. Mm -hmm. And you said that's coming out when or hopefully? It's coming out later this year. Um, it was accepted uh, just uh, late last year. So we are hoping that by the end of the year, it'll be out. Mm -hmm. um, do, and Cooper, I imagine your answer to this question will be no, but do either of you have social media or website that, that you have that people can follow your work or updates? I have a website, uh, which mm -hmm. just, you know, it's just things I have, I have done in the past. It's, okay. it's sort of a large resume is what it is. And as I say, I, I really don't have anything much to add to it, except I have to add this book, I guess. Mm -hmm. uh, but sure? no, I don't really have anything cooking out there. I'm not very good on... <laughs> on, on this technology anyway so uh well what's the web and i'll tell you what i'm doing <laughs> and what's the website name oh god coopercgram.com okay all right i'll double check it and put it in the show notes <laughs> okay <laughs> i have a i have a website uh it's christophermshaw.com one word and, and i do i do i do update it uh, pretty regularly uh, okay uh, can you spell that? Can you spell uh, it out just for listening? H r i s t o p h i r m s c h e r dot com. Okay. Okay. Good. Um, I think I think that's the same thing I have. I just one word. Cooper C Graham. dot com. I think that's it. Okay. Okay. Um, well, that's all the questions I have. Do um, either of you have any parting thoughts or words? As I say, if anybody finds. Um, has any recollections about Charlie or Florence or Max or, you know, please come forward and, you know, always nice to learn something new. So it's all about. Okay, good, good. I'll just quote the last line from our book, uh, which is from the limelight, um, uh, from limelight, not the limelight, limelight, uh, the heart and the mind, what an enigma. And that's, that was essentially what, uh, what kept us going as we were working on the book. Oh yeah, yeah, it's a strong sentiment. Um, all right, well, thank you both for speaking with me. Thank you for having us. Thank you so much. In the next episode, I speak with Sarah McFarland about Echo Collapse fiction and human extinction. Hit the subscribe button to catch that episode. Thank you for watching this video version of Full Contact Nerd Interviews. If you liked the episode, please subscribe and hit the like button. If you'd like more book suggestions or information on fiction and storytelling, including sci-fi, horror, fantasy, mysteries, thrillers, film history, gaming, and more, please check out my podcast, Full Contact Nerd Interviews, my YouTube channel, Chris Alvarez Full Contact Nerd, and my webpage, chrisalvarez.com or fullcontactnerd.com. If you're looking for military history and general history, including true crime, please check out my YouTube channel, War Scholar, my podcast, Military History Inside Out, and my webpage, warscholar.org, or militaryhistorypodcast.com. If you're looking for space history and the science, technology, and business of space, check out my YouTube channel, Spacewalks Money Talks, my podcast, Technology in Space, and my website, technologyinspace.com. Thank you for watching, and keep imagining the past, the present, and the future. Mm -hmm.